Welcome to Cincy Reform Podcast. I'm Pastor Brandon, joined with uh, Pastor Zach. We are pastors at Westside Reform Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, today we wanted to talk about liberalism. Uh, now, we're not talking politics and, you know, Democrats and Republicans and all of that. We're talking about theological liberalism. And it's something that is very much alive. Um, it uh, has different, um, maybe, faces or costumes, but it's, it's, it's been alive. Um, just to kind of give a, I don't know, I guess a brief historical overview of theological liberalism uh, before we jump into some of the details in our American context. Liberalism really started getting its roots in the 17th century. Um, there was a person named Godhold Lessing, and he basically said that we should not root our faith in history. We should not root our faith in anything historical. Um, and that creates a problem for the Christian faith because the Christian faith is a, a very much rooted in history and what God has done in and through redemptive history, uh, in, 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 in and through uh, covenant history. And so it creates a problem. So uh, if we're not going to root our faith in history, well, there goes the historical resurrection of Christ. There goes the miracles. There goes the, um, the Bible as this historical book of, of testimony and uh, obviously um, Holy Spirit inspired and, and all of that. So it really shakes up the entire Christian faith. Uh, at that point, when you try to detach it, and people would call would call that um, Lessing's um, great ugly ditch, and the theological liberals basically thought that Lessing had a point, and we should kind of detach faith from from history. And so you had German higher criticism that was coming out of Germany, obviously, and it was basically a movement that looked at the Bible like any other piece of literature. It was it was looking at the Bible as a man-made, man-preserved, man-produced book, and however you would understand Shakespeare just kind of got mapped on to how we understand um, the Bible. Uh, R.C. Sproul, he, he tells a story about when the Germans were um, bombing England. One of the German bombs landed near the tombstone of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon, on his tombstone, apparently he had like a Bible, uh, like a carved Bible image. And the bomb blew the Bible um, off of the tombstone on the ground. And um, R.C. Sproul made the connection of, like, that's kind of how theological liberalism was uh, coming out of Germany. I've never heard that one. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, many uh, pastors were going to, to maybe Germany studying and then bringing home these ideas uh, about, oh, you know, this, this book, man, made, and it was just, it was heavily redacted and edited by, by men, and uh, the Bible became a non-supernatural book, a non-work of God, work of the Holy Spirit, but it became just the work of men. Um, and, uh, and then there was, so if you're not going to root um, your faith in history, what are you going to root it in? Um, Immanuel Kant um, su suggested ethics, and so it became kind of this ethical community of social reform. Let's come together and do the morals of Jesus. Let's look at the Bible and just follow moral teachings or something. But let's not believe in all of that supernatural stuff. Let's not believe in the miracles. Let's not even believe in the inspiration and infallibility of the Bible. Um, but let us just, I don't know, look to Jesus like we might look to, um, I don't know, some, some, uh, a figure out of the Odyssey or... Um, some, some heroic person in one of um, Aesop's fables, and let's just kind of map Jesus onto one of these great ca uh, characters and follow good morals. And at that point, the church then becomes more of a kind of a social, um, active, moral society where maybe you just want to open up a soup kitchen or something like that, and that's really the extent of it. It's not because you actually believe in heaven or hell and God and Jesus and resurrection and all of these things, but you want to help the poor and help your neighbor, and so you band together and you think that Jesus maybe did that better than other people. Um, so that's kind of a, 
kind of historic, very um, high view, brief survey uh, history of theological liberalism. Uh, but Zach, how did that? How does that map onto our American context? How did that maybe take off in America? Uh, where do we see it in America? Any thoughts? Sure, yeah. Well, I think if we reflect back upon America's founding, we see that a lot of the institutions that uh, we think of today as institutions of you know, higher learning, Ivy League kind of schools, I mean, those places began as seminaries and places to train uh, ministers, but in many ways, those seminaries very quickly gave in to the Enlightenment ideas that Brandon's been describing. And uh, instead of studying theology and, and God uh, through the Bible, they began to study religion instead. So a, a Christian experience. Well, as we also think about the um, uh, background of American life and American Christianity, there's been a, a strong impulse toward a sort of post-millennial um, viewpoint in American society where America would become this city on the hill to uh, transform all of the world, to bring in a Christianized world that um, uh, would, uh, where all nations would bow the knee to Jesus Christ. And so this kind of a, um, a, a view of Christianity that um, uh, would overtake uh, society overtake cultures and uh, uh, transform cultures in that sort of a way. Well, th that was very much near and dear to much of the, the Puritan experience early on. And we start to see that kind of uh, uh, morph when, with the uh, Great Awakenings, or as some people say, the not-so-great Awakenings. The, uh, the first awakening was maybe more theologically orthodox, but the, the second Great Awakening begins to bring religious experience and this... Um, this um, post-millennial desire uh, so, so people could begin to taste the uh, social reform that was being called for and many of the 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 ways that the uh, awakening preachers would uh, address the congregations would be to uh, encourage them toward moral reform against drunkenness and against uh, slavery and against other kinds of social ills that might have been truly socially uh, problematic but began to move away from historic Orthodox Christianity more towards this social reform to change American society. And as this, um, as American Christianity began to depart more and more from historic uh, Christian Orthodoxy and move more and more towards a, a quest for social order, we also have the arrival then of some world wars that uh, really shook up American society. That as we began to seek more reform, we had this uh, disaster across the world with the, the two world wars. And that just encouraged us more and more to seek to uh, change the world and to change the world through social reform rather than to focus on the, the heralding of Christ crucified and a ministry of word and sacraments. Within all this stuff, and if you think about these uh, great awakenings of the um, uh, 18th and 19th centuries, and as you think about the world wars in the early 20th century, you begin to think about this view that is um, emphasizing the social order over against the uh, doctrines and dogmas of distinct theological traditions, then you can kind of guess what's going to happen next that distinct theological traditions and distinct theological beliefs begin to be marginalized because they're, they're hindering then the, a, a unified Christian um, machine that could then drive American life. And so the historic Reformed identity, the historic Presbyterian identity, historic uh, Methodism or Baptist uh, the theology and uh, Episcopal theology, all these things begin to be marginalized for this more united front that would propel America forward and to propel American society forward and to propel American society forward in order to change the world. And we call that the mainline denominations, the mainline movement that's part of the ecumenical movement that emerges in the 20th century alongside the 
problematic world wars and uh, to emerge alongside the marginalization of distinct uh, dogmas that uh, these churches held. And again, if those are marginalized and you allow them to just unify for the sake of unity. And where do you find unity then? If you don't have theological unity, you have social unity. So you begin to prioritize those kinds of things instead. And so today in our day, we see um, denominations like the PC USA, the Presbyterian Church USA, most of the big, beautiful buildings that you see, if, they're, if they have Presbyterian on the uh, sign, most likely they're going to be um, from a, a liberal theological uh, vantage point. Or if you look at the United Church of Christ, that was a merger of uh, liberal reforms and Lutheran and some congregational uh, traditions that all just came together and partnered together to, um, uh, to promote social uh, change rather than the historic uh, beliefs of the Reformed Lutheran and congregational uh, backgrounds. If you see United Methodist or American Baptist, the Episcopal Church USA, Disci uh, uh, Disciples of Christ, is that correct? Disciples Another one? Church, yeah. Disciples Church, yeah. yeah. CRC. So CRC is now becoming that, has moved in that way. The Christian Reformed Church, which is the um, background to the United Reformed Churches that we belong to. It's a lot of liberalizing trends, the Reformed Church in America also, but uh, have, have begun to really um, uh, prioritize, against social reformed and uh, ecumenical movements and unity over against historic creeds and confessions and, and worship and so forth. But um, yeah, Brandon, uh, do you want to give any thoughts in terms of maybe some uh, help to the, the people in the pew as they think about these, um, these churches within American society and if they perhaps are looking for a church and they're trying to analyze uh, what might be a faithful church, you might give them some guidance. You know, obviously we're guiding them away from just thinking about Christian experience uh, to something maybe more objective, how might you um, shepherd them? Yeah, I, I think it's helpful for, you know, to kind of know the landscape a bit, and, and I like how you, you, you talked about how there's um, different movements within the big kind of umbrella of each tradition that have, has gone more left. So, for example, you know, I, um, um, somebody came to me once and said, hey, I went to, uh, I went to the Presbyterian Church on, on um, Sunday. And it was like, well, that's great, but which one did you go to? Did you go to the um, Presbyterian Church USA? Did you go to the Presbyterian Church America? Did you go to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church? Um, because there are many, and, and the same in the Baptist world. You have Southern Baptists, um, you have um, the uh, Reformed Baptist churches, you have um, American Baptists, and the American Baptists are the kind of the, the left wing there. Um, same with the, the Disciples Church. And, and so it's helpful to know that as you might go to a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or a Lutheran church, there are some denominations within that that are going to be um, infected with theological liberalism. And so I think knowing the landscape so you can avoid that. Um, but the, the Belgian Confession, I think, gives us some great help here in Article 29. The Belgic Confession um, compares and contrasts a true church and a false church. And um, the Belgic Confession says that a true church is going to have the three marks. And the three marks of the church are the faithful preaching of the word, uh, the, uh, uh, the pure administration of the sacraments, and church discipline. And so you, you want to find a church that has those marks. You want a church that's going to faithfully preach the Bible, not marginalize the Bible and say, well, it's not really um, from God, and we only look to the moral things that Jesus said. No, the Bible, the whole Bible, the, all the 66 books of the Bible being um, without error and infallible and so on. And so um, find a church that is going to stand on the authority of Scripture and preach from that scripture, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he actually um, was born of the Virgin Mary, that he actually kept the law of God in history, that he died on a cross 2,000 years ago, that he rose again from the dead in history, and uh, he's going to come back one day in history. And so we, we, we want a, a church that's going to stand on the authority of scripture and preach 
the true gospel that's contained in Scripture. We also want a church that's going to administer the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Um, and I went to one um, liberal church. I was in a different country, actually. I was in Germany. And uh, there was there was a Catholic church and this Protestant church. I had, I, I had no idea what the Protestant church was about. It was historic. I went into it, and um, there was no Bible at all in the, in the entire service. And instead of the Lord's Supper, they handed out oranges. Um, and so uh, you want a church that's going to administer the sacraments. Um, and then also a church that's going to um, care about the holiness of Christ's church and will conduct church discipline as Christ has commanded, Matthew 18, as the Apostle Paul did in 1 Corinthians 5. And um, <clears throat> But it also, the Belgian Confession, Article 29, talks about how the false church then um, is going to put more weight on man-made things and not weight on what the Bible says. It's going to look to man-made ideas and man-made traditions and not the biblical traditions of Scripture as given to us in the Bible and uh, as we see um, in the early church and in the um, Reformers. And so as we're, as we're thinking about uh, belonging to a healthy church, I would advise reading the Belgic Confession, Article 29. I think that's just a great help for anybody who's trying to um, look for a good church or making sure the church that you're in is not one of the liberal churches, um, but is a faithful um, uh, church that's going to follow Christ. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think that the recommendation to read the Belgic Confession is especially helpful because what you will find out there is that sometimes there are congregations within some of these broader liberal denominations that are still faithful. Mm -hmm. We want to acknowledge that just to make sure we are talking about big ideas here. We are painting the broad brush, but the Belgian Confession encourages us to look locally and to ask about this congregation, is the Bible being preached faithfully, the sacraments being administered faithfully, is church discipline being exercised? Because there can be a, a breadth within different denominations out there. Now, I think that if you are part of a denomination that accepts theological liberalism, that is problematic. And so I would not, uh, we're, we're not personally part of that, and so I would not want to be part of that. But I also want to make clear that um, there can be local churches from place to place that do go against what might be the ordinary thing within um, a, a more liberal mainline denomination. So just want to put that out there as well. That's helpful. But Brian, I think you're also going to be uh, maybe introducing us to a key text yeah. that uh, I appreciate, I know, reading the past. And actually, the, the last page of that book is actually one of my favorite pages. Uh, <laughs> and I read that regularly. It's so good. <laughs> but... Um, I hope that you might maybe introduce our, our listeners to this book, to uh, tell them about this, and just to, you need to read this book. It's a good one, I promise you. I yes. promise you. Yes. So this book is um, Christianity and Liberalism, and it is by J. Gresham Machen. Um, Machen is um, one of the great defenders against the liberalizing trends. Um, he was part of the PCUSA. Uh, he taught at Princeton. And what began to happen at Princeton was um, many of the, of the kind of local uh, churches in the PCA, USA were going left. They were going more liberal. And so the board um, told Princeton, because you represent the churches, uh, then the faculty needs to represent the churches. And so they started bringing on board members and faculty members that didn't have to stand upon the historic Christian faith as taught by B.B. Warfield and Charles Hodge and A.A. A. Hodge and all, all the great, uh, the old Princetonians that were there uh, prior to. But they started um, bringing on people who were okay with a more liberalizing progressive trend. And Machen saw that as the beginning of the end. As you're bringing on these professors and these board members, it's going to um, go bad. And so he sounded the alarm, and uh, he was ultimately kicked out of the PC USA. And he formed a different denomination. He formed the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC. 
Uh, he all, also uh, formed a new um, seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary in uh, Glenside, Pennsylvania, uh, to be kind of the old Princeton of, of what B.B. Warfield was was um, teaching and defending um, uh, prior to the liberalizing trends that were happening. And so this is just a great book. And what he does in this book, and by the way, Machen studied in Germany. So, I mean, he studied under the liberal professors who devalued scripture and elevated human autonomy and made religion about uh, the, the autonomous reason of man and uh, really just totally devalued scripture. And so he's wrestling, even as he's studying under these professors, he's wrestling uh, just in his own faith, in his own life, um, and, and obviously maintaining a true, sound, and orthodox Christianity all the way through it. So it's not like he doesn't understand liberals. He, he fully understands them. He studied underneath them uh, in Germany, and uh, so he, he, he gets them. He wrote this book, and each book is, each chapter is, is about uh, something different. So uh, one chapter is on doctrine, one's on God and man, one's on the Bible, one's on Christ, salvation, the church. He goes through the different loci, and he basically compares and contrasts, and he talks about what the liberals are talking about and how they're understanding Jesus, because he noticed that we're using a lot of the same words. Because the liberals are saying Jesus, sin, salvation, church, but they gave different definitions to those words. And so he's sounding the alarm and saying, hey, we're using a lot of the same terminology, but we don't mean the same thing by the terms that we're using. And so uh, he ultimately, as the title shows, Christianity and Liberalism, he's arguing in this book that liberalism is not Christianity. It is a completely different religion altogether. And so, um, and that's why it's so dangerous, because on the surface, if you walk into a church that's liberal, you're going to hear a lot of the same kind of buzzwords about Jesus, and buzzwords about salvation, uh, and talk of love, and so on and so forth. But all of that is going to be redefined and given different definitions. And so Machen is saying, be careful, because on the surface, you might just think, oh, we're all the same. And we are two completely different religions altogether. And so that's why we, we need to, I think, uh, be mindful, be vigilant, uh, not follow the, um, the Germans and the higher criticism or Schleiermacher who, who talked about you know, this kind of God consciousness and this heart feeling uh, in us. And, 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 uh, and yeah, so we have a historic faith, and that's what Machen, I think, is trying to, trying to defend. Um, anything else about this book that you wanted to... I want to read the last part of it okay. for our listeners. I think that that might be a, a nice, awesome note to end on. I see that you have something to underline as well. So uh, he asks at the end, as he thinks about uh, all of the problems that have ailed uh, modern society, all the things that liberalism is trying to address, he says... Is there no refuge from strife? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name to forget for the moment all those things that divide nation from nation and race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife, and to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross? If there be such a place, then that is the house of God, and that the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world. Amen. And so Mason found the source, the solution to the problems that afflict life as the faithful church that administers the Sacraments faithfully, preaches the gospel faithfully, exercises church discipline as scripture would, would have it, and that that is actually the solution <clears throat> for the problems that afflict us in our day. So, Brandon, would you like to say goodbye to our listeners today? Yeah, we, this is a production of uh, Cincy Reformed P Podcast. Uh, Cincy Reformed is <clears throat> sponsored by Westside Reformed Church in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. You can um, um, look us up at cincyreform.org or westsidereform.org. Thanks for tuning in.